Okay, valve train. Uh, what do we want to say here? I'm just going to say cam. I'm not going to say cam anything, just the cam. The cam. Now, there are two types. Care to give me one of two types? And give me the first one first. Two types. One. What's Continental like homing? Yeah. That'll be the top and the bottom. No. Nice try, though. I like that you're interactive. <laughs> cam ring. Cam. Where do we find a cam ring? Yep. Used on radial engines. Uh, and then we have the camshaft. Now under camshaft, I'm going to say that it rotates at what speed? One half crank speed, which is kind of what you said. I did not put that under the cam ring. So pretty much camshaft is going to be used on all the other types of engines. Um, but all of them, all of them, work on the same principle, uh, utilizes, utilizes lobes to press a follower. Boy, do I have a lot of stuff I could write. Opposed engines have a shared intake lobe. Four-cylinder engines have six lobes. Four for exhaust, two for intake. Shared lobe is wider. Journal. Journals, gear teeth, lobes are hardened. Carburized. Carper coat prevents carburizing. We talked about that, so I don't have to go into all that. Um, Janet, you done writing? Uh, You're my pace car. Okay, we're good. All right. Well, she's the pace car, dude. <laughs> I can't help it now. Yeah, take it up with her. <laughs> All right, uh, radial engines, radial, radial. So the radial, which is the cam ring. Your numbers are so off. Uh, oh, because I'm skipping stuff, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just put whatever you want, that's okay. Uh, has two tracks. Do I have a picture of a cam ring is the big question here. <coughs> I don't. So sorry. <laughs> I usually bring one in with me, but I didn't this time. All right, it has two tracks. So it's just a, it's a radial engine. It's, it's a ring. And it has to be a ring. It can't be a shaft because all the cylinders are all in the same plane. Well, not airplane, but the same geometric plane. <laughs> and so you've got uh, the cam has got one track that has lobes on it and has the, a roller follower that are right in that track and then behind it is going to be a second track with lobes that will be offset in a different way and that's going to be the either the intake or the exhaust track so it has the two tracks one intake one exhaust one Does intake have a cam ring for every road yes you yeah. must one intake one exhaust and then just like uh, MJ asked one ring assembly per row of cylinders, per row of cylinders. I'm gonna leave these two things out because it's not necessarily true on all. Ring turns in the opposite direction to crank some engines. And cam speed is one divided by number of lobes times two. You don't need to know that. All right, uh, the lobe, the lobe ramp, the low ramp, not ramp, ramp, ramp design is, um, uh, let, me, let me rephrase that, lobe ramp how about, is designed, is designed to minimize opening and closing shock.
So in other words, it doesn't want to slam it open and let it slam closed. You want that rocker arm to come up and just kind of kiss it, a little peck, and then push on it. And then as it closes, close easy at the end, and then release. Would that help, help with uh, spring float? Down. Yeah, probably helps the spring float. It keeps the valve from pounding into the seat and, and damaging it too. Yeah? I read like a big article last night. It might have been more automotive related, but it said that the cam ramp is actually like, I forget like exactly what it said, but it said the design of the ramp is to kind of minimize that spring surge into the valve float. Yeah, that makes sense. Making more contact with it around or something like yeah, that. Yeah, because the whole thing is you don't want to just slam it open because then it's going to go too far and come back and hit. It's like one of those balloons on the uh, rubber band. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I had one. That's all I had as a kid as a, <laughs> as a toy. Well, I had a stick, too. I mean, we were poor. <laughs> Uh, all right. Oops, that's just two, I think. Two. We gotta keep it keep it straight here. Janet's gonna come up here and slap me around. Causes it would be on number five, but causes a cam failure. Cam failure is a big deal in uh, aviation engines, and all, far too often it's the first thing that fails especially on light combings because they're up high where the moisture tends to collect. So you really want to take good care of your cam. Uh, so what causes cam failure? Well, number one, I would say is inactive engine. Just letting it sit around and not work. That's bad. Uh, high RPM starts. Um, cold starts without preheat. Out, preheat. What lubricates the cam lobes? Engine oil. Engine oil. How's the engine oil get there? Who says splash? Splash. Give yourself a point. Splash. The lobes. The lobes. The journals are pressure oil. What's splashing? Just off, like off the cylinder walls. Well, think about the, the crankshaft is it's spinning around pretty fast. And so you've got pressure oil coming into the rod journals. And that rod's <coughs> going around. And that pressure oils it. And that oil leaks out. And it splashes all over the place. Okay. It flings it around. Uh, valve adjustment. Valve adjust or valve adjustment improper. That's, I actually show valve action misadjustment. Valve adjustment, we'll say off, valve adjustment off. That could be too tight or too loose, too tight or too loose. Sticking valves. And overspeed. Let's talk a little bit about, this is why my notes are all off, because I talk about it and then I don't write it wrong. All right, so valve adjustment. Most all aircraft engines have hydraulic lifters. And so what that means is when you're building up an engine, you have these hydraulic units that actually inflate with oil and deflate without. And so when you're building up the engine, you make sure that your hydraulic lifters are deflated and you put a push rod in and you put the rocker arm in and you measure the clearance between the tip of the rocker arm and the tip of the valve. And it's actually quite a big clearance. It's like uh, 30 to uh, 0.110. So it, it can be a very large clearance. And what happens is as you start the engine up, the lifters pump up full of oil and it pushes the push rod out to the point where the rocker arm just comes up and just touches it. So that's called the running valve clearance. So that is zero. So running valve clearance is zero. That's a Q&A question, I think. And so you should expect to see no gap whatsoever. Now, the Lycoming 290s and the 235, the one, the little sister to it, they have solid lifters. So there's none of this pumping up action. And in fact, it's funny, even the little Continental A65s have hydraulic lifters. Why, why Lycoming didn't want to go with them, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so you have everything is solid. 
So what's going to happen is you are going to set an absolute clearance on your engine. And it's, never going to, it's not going to change except for heat expansion. So you have a little bit of clearance when you're done fit your, building up your engine. I'm going, to, I'm going to come around and check it. It's got to be a certain range. And so there's a little spot there. And then what happens as the engine heats up and warms up, the cylinders are going to expand and they get longer. Well, if the cylinder gets longer, that means the rocker arm just got further away from the camshaft. So if the, if the rocker arm gets further away from the camshaft, what is it going to do to the space between the cam and the valve? It's going to get bigger. So whatever space you're giving it by the manual, it's actually going to get worse, which is crazy to think. You would think that it'd be big and you'd want it to come down. It doesn't work that way because of expansion. So keep that in mind, that it's going to get bigger. And if you miss time or miss set this gap so let's say you make the gap way too big and some people do they just got in the wrong stroke and it's like this huge gap what's that going to do to the valve opening if the, if the gap is too big less of an opening what does it do for the timing of it opening delays, delays it so it's going to open much later. yeah the, the rock arm's coming up it should have hit it and opened by now but it's not it's got to wait 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 no you're too late now it's going to start to open and just about the time it gets opening, the cam's going to start going the other way. Oh, time to close. And so it should be closing, 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 but it's just going to oh, close. So it's going to open late, late and close early. early. A shorter duration. Um, the follower. Follower or the lifter. Uh, technically, I call that the lifter body. So it rides against the cam lobe. Rides against <coughs> the cam lobe. Um, we have the roller type, which is typical for radials. And becoming, um, let me see, more common, becoming common and opposed. And so we have the roller, and then we have the what we call the solid tappet body, or non roller. And I showed you that there's different types, again, kind of like valves. You don't necessarily need to know the difference because you can't select it. But every now and then, this is out of light combing, um, every now and then you'll have to figure out, it'll say something about well, hyper, hyper, hyperbolic tappets uh, measure here and here. Where would you measure hyperbolic tappet? Like here, or here, or here? How about in the middle where it's the fattest? How would you know if you have a hyper or not the, the, the <laughs> measure it here and measure it here and if those two are different then guess what <laughs> if it's getting fatter in the middle chances are I was looking that's good all right uh, okay Let's see what else can we do here rollers the tappets um, We'll do this follower. Well, I don't even know what number to use now. What should I use? One, if you use two, just point two. Mm -hmm. Why not? Um, what did I want to say here? Uh, cam and tap it are ground to cause rotation. So what you should see on a properly operating tap it are little circles. So that looks pretty good. And that looks pretty good. That is not. That is spalling, which is a removal of material. Um, that one's nice and normal. 
See these little dots right here? Probably Rockwell hardness tests. So that's how you test the hardness of something. You, it's with a punch, and it punches it and leaves a little dot right there. So should be nice and round. If it's not, and it's not rotating, well, there's a problem. You want it to rotate. All right. Can tap it around to cause rotation. Um, let's see. Let's say once once operated, do not change positions. So it's really important. They've, they've worked themselves together. One, one uh, lobe and one tappet are now a match set. If you put them somewhere else, the likelihood of failure is going to increase. Now, it used to be the rule that you never, if you, if you replaced the tappets, you should always have the camshaft either reground or replaced. And that was kind of the, always the way it was. So. Uh, and it wasn't a problem with, especially like your Lycomings, because by the time you got the tappet out, well, the camshaft had to come out anyway, right? So you could kind of change it around. But Continental sort of changed that up, and they don't seem to care. So especially with their big engines, the big bore, the 470s, 520s, 550s, you can take the tappet right out because they just, once you take the cylinder pushrod tubes off, they can just grab them with a plier and just pull them right out. And it's one, one big piece, the whole thing, and you can swap them out. They'll tell you to swap them out. Yeah. Have you ever heard the statement, the cam went flat? Went yep. Flat? What does that mean? Oh, okay. That's a great question. That happens a lot to Lycomings. So usually what you're going to see is a lot of mechanics do oil analysis. Their owners do oil analysis. In fact, I was just looking at Juan's oil analysis. He's got um, steel, iron is spiking in his engine. So he brought it in. So what does this mean? Well, a lot of times, especially Lycomings, because it has the, upper, the cam up top, is the cam starts going going flat, which means that that ramp starts going away, starts wearing down okay. to a perfect circle. And I've seen, it's crazy. I've seen some where it's like there's almost no ramp left, and the the owner did not complain about a power loss. I'm like yeah, it ran great. <laughs> wow, it ran great. It's like that valve wasn't opening much, but that just speaks to the resiliency of these engines. Uh, okay, no, so we do that. Rotation once installed. Yeah, do change positions. Um, make this. Four. Um, what? Normal, normal wear pattern is. Um, what I say is circles. Yeah, the cam is grounded and angled to promote tappet rotation. As the tappet wears, it leaves circular rings. Maybe solid or hydraulic. We talked about that. Let's talk about the hydraulic unit. Hydraulic. With no number, I'll just put a star because, you know, I'm running out of numbers. I don't know what to do. Um, hydraulic unit, also called zero lash. It's zero lash system. All right, so this is a camshaft right here. I had a number seven. This is my, hydra my, my uh, tappet body. Okay, and inside the tappet body is a hydraulic unit. It's a two-piece unit. They are matched for life. They are made that way. They are set at the factory. When they come out, you cannot, you cannot change, interchange them. So they must always be kept where they are supposed to be. And then a little cup right here that just sits on there. And I wish I had a better picture of that, because, but I don't. So, but I do have a picture of this. There. So there's the part of the hydraulic unit. There's the part that pushes into it, and then there's a cap that sits on it that is uh, allows the push rod to go in there. So I'm talking about these two pieces right here, pretty much. There we go. So what happens is from the oil gallery in the crankcase. We have high pressure, or yeah, high pressure oil is fed up into a hole, which then goes through another hole and fills up inside of the tappet body. So the tappet body then fills full of oil pressure, which comes through this right here, offseats the little ball, and comes in here and fills up this space, number four, 
and pushes this 11 out. And it pushes against the push rod until the push rod goes up and just touches the rocker arm. So the whole thing is now inflated. And then what happens from there is as this comes around and it pushes on the tappet body, the, the whole assembly moves forward and pushes on the push rod. And at the same time, the pressure of that causes this to bleed down. That bleeding down allows oil to come up through here, around here, and down the push rod and feed oil to the rocker arm under pressure. It's just that simple. Sounds like too many moving parts. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's one moving part, this little ball. All right, so what, what can go wrong here? It gets stuck. Let's see. Oil under pressure inflates the lifter through oil gallery, through the hole in the tap of body, past the ball, check valve, and inflates the cylinder to the point where the cylinder inflates. Yes, to where the plunger pushes on the... Yeah, I said all that. I did a good job there. That sits all inside the tappet. Uh-huh. Body. Inside the tap of body. Yep. Um, like, so if you drop a tappet, for example, or something happens, like... Why would you drop a tappet? Uh, drop it, like, <laughs> if something damaged inside of that, anything, you know... How no, like noticeable is it going to be compared to like? Is it like? What did like, you do? <laughs> <laughs> the hydraulic unit. What if you damage the hydraulic unit? Okay. Well, here's the things that can go wrong, and you have to take some notes on this. So the number one absolute no-no is you don't use magnets to pull these out, because they say that the magnet will magnetize this little ball and then it won't want to sit here where it's supposed to. It sits out here, and then it doesn't actually keep the oil pressure in there. It doesn't regulate, I don't want to say regulate, it doesn't keep the oil pressure in there. Because when you have these things in your hand, and, and Larry's going to go over this too with you guys quite a bit because, and that's the agreement I have with him, is you're working on a solid lifter engine. There goes one. <laughs> you're working on a solid lifter engine, and when you get out to second year, he's going to have you pull all the cylinders and work the hydraulic in it so that you get experience on both sides. So he's really going to talk a lot more about these. But uh, in the, So you'll get it again. But in the meantime, number one, you don't pull them out with a magnet because it magnetizes them, and that creates a problem. So you use a little piece of just 041 safety wire, just a little tiny hook, and just reach in there, pop it right out, and they come right out. Um, well, I could go on and on about these things. You'll probably forget what I said. Um, so where do I want to go with this? All right, so you take them out. And one of the, the, the big problems I see out in the field is mechanics don't bleed them down. And when you don't bleed them down, so let's say you take a cylinder off and you have it repaired and you put a new cylinder on. Well, you've got to bleed all this stuff down or you can't check what we call the dry tappet clearance. And the dry tappet clearance is just that. It means this tappet is dry. So when I assemble the whole thing and I push on the push rod, I can push the push rod or the rocker arm, I can push the push rod back and I can cause this plunger to actually go inside all the way because that's what you're supposed to check. You're supposed to check that clearance at that point. And so what happens is in, all the time, so uh, mechanics change it out and I say, well, did you, did you drain down the tappet? No, should I? Well, how do you check dry tappet clearance if you don't do it? In fact, usually it becomes a problem. They call them and go, yeah, I can't get the rocker arms in. Why not? Because the push rod's too long. Would you check, drain down the tappet? No. All right, well, tappet's inflated, and so it, it just doesn't all fit together anymore. So you have to drain this down. Well, how do you drain it down? Uh, a couple of things. One, uh, I figured out the hard way, because I use a lot of oil on building up engines. If you use a lot of oil and fill the tappet body with oil and then push the hydraulic unit in, it will pump itself up. And then you gotta pull it back out and you gotta clean all the oil out and you gotta clean it out. So the way these things work is they actually have, it's funny, you can't pull them apart. They don't just pull apart. Uh, they have a little spring to them. There we go. They have this little spring that actually locks inside of this, this uh, receptacle, this cup. And so you push them together and you give them a little, little twist and they're totally locked. And to get them apart, you push and twist the other way. They come right apart. So people are pulling. They say, well, let me see that. And you just, here you go. <laughs> so I can't tell you how I did it. All right. So, so to work with these, what I do is I use like uh, LPS-1, which is like WD-40. And so I fill this little cup with LPS-1. And I push that together. And I use a, uh, like a brass rod or something. And I push it up inside of this tube. What's inside of this tube up in there? 
the little ball. So I push it together, unseat the ball, push it together, lock it, and then I, I work it with the ball until it's completely deflated and I can it doesn't have any LPS or WD-40 in there. And you can push it and then put just a little bit of uh, LPS or WD-40 around the outside, carefully put it inside of the tappet body right here, slide it up in there, and now you can do dry tappet clearance when you get around to that. So they're really easy to work with, but yet you just have to know a few tricks. So, do you prefer the regular tappets or the hydraulic ones? Oh, hydraulic every day. Because if you have the solid ones, you have to, it takes forever to adjust them. All right, so let me ask you this then, super, super mechanics. I have to check dry tappet clearance. So I, I do everything I just did properly. I deflate the tappet. I use some WD-40 in there. I put it all together. It's deflated properly. I shove it up inside my tappet. And then I take my push rod. I put my push rod in. And then I put my rocker arm on. And I go to do my dry tappet clearance. And it is too much. Too much clearance? Too much clearance. What am I going to do? There you go. Start by making sure I have the right stroke. <laughs> and I do. Longer push rod. Push rods come in oversizes for this very reason. So they're standard 10, 20, 30, 60, 90. They, they get long. And so if you have too much clearance, you put a longer push rod. And it pushes the back of the rocker arm out. Or if you don't have enough, get a shorter one. It makes the rocker arm go out. It's that simple. It's that simple. <laughs> What's that? Well, you, you grab when, you, when you're taking it off, you're disassembling it. It works perfectly fine, but when you try to put it all back together. Well, that's an excellent question. So let's just say you took the cylinder off, and you yourself are the guy who managed to overhaul the cylinder. Overhaul, even though you didn't test it. Um, and so what did you do to the valve? Well, you ground off a little bit of the valve which makes it go up inside the seat a little more. But you also reface the seat, which made it go up a little bit more. But maybe you ground a little bit right here, which took away some of that. And then you, the rocker, so that it all changed right there. Or you change out the cylinder, and for whatever reason, um, you know, if I replace the seats and I cut a new seat boss, we always did one little swipe with the cutter until we got clean metal and the, the boss does that mean that seat sat just about a 30 second or less different than it used to? So everything changes by little tiny bits. A little tiny bit of change adds up to a lot of something, which is probably is a really good segue into the next thing I want to talk about. Let me see. I'm just going to tell you about this. Since it's on my mind, anybody find a pin cap for me? No. He had one job. It's an impossibility, huh? All right. As many as I can get. What a nice picture. The only picture I'm going to get is this one. All right, you gotta, you gotta put your imagination cap on here. Work with me on this. When you work on a cylinder, you've got to cylinder boss and that cylinder boss is got to be lined up perfectly with this seat boss perfectly and totally down the center <clears throat> if one is off this way and one is off that way you've got a little bit of problem valve will sit just a little bit we're talking about thousands of an inch right or less than thousands of an inch so number one you got to hope that that seat boss is perfectly centered inside of the guide boss. But then you're gonna put a seat in. You better hope that that seat was made exactly and totally perfect. And you're gonna put this guide in and maybe you got a guide that was not pre-reamed so you have to line bore that. And you better hope that when you line bore that, it is perfectly and absolutely centered along that seat. And then you've got up here on the, on the top end, you've got a rocker shaft that goes in some rocker uh, shaft bushings and you better hope that those rocker bosses were bored exactly and perfectly concentric to the machine that you just did. And then you got bushings that have to be line bored and they had better be absolutely concentric to this so that it's not sitting this way or that way, but perfectly like this. But wait, there's more. You have a rocker arm. You have a rocker arm that has an inside bore to it that has a bushing that's been pressed in there. And you better hope that that bushing has been burnished and or line board to the exact perfect concentric 
alignment. So if you counted all the alignments that I'm talking about? Yeah, a lot. Okay, then we have a seat that's probably been refaced once or twice in its life, and you better hope that that's, that this, did I say seat, a foot, this foot is absolutely in 100% parallel to the line boring that had to have been perfect on this rocker arm. And I tell you all that to tell you that if you didn't do all of that 100% accurately perfect to, it's an industry term, and that's ass, then what's going to happen at some point, and I will exaggerate, is you have a valve that is sitting here and a rocker arm that's going to come down and hit it crooked. So a rocker arm that hits a valve crooked will push it off to one side. When it pushes it off to one side, it's going to prematurely wear out the guide to that side, and you're going to have a cylinder failure out of that guide much faster than anything else. So what you need in a perfect world is the foot of the rocker arm comes down and hits the tip of that. It better hit it absolutely perfectly coming down. What are the odds of that happening? Not very good. Not very good. It's, it's, it's about the right odds. So what are you going to do about it? No. Okay. So I told you I had approval to reface rocker arm feet. That's the foot right here. I had permission to do that. I had an op spec to do that. And one of the modifications that I made was that I, I was kind of proud of myself as I is, well, I don't have the machine to show you, but I drilled some holes in my machine and I put little Teflon buttons so that I could make that rocker arm move one way or the other. So I had a flat plate and we would line up and do the rocker arm, check it on a flat plate, make sure that it actually hit perfectly square and was aligned. Then I would take it and put it in a cylinder and look at, see exactly how that rocker arm would fit that one special little uh, valve. And I would take, where's my pin? Cap. You got my grate? All right, we'll take that one. Is that it? You chew on it? You chew no, the end off. Not. Well, that's it. I completely. Let me get. All right, we'll take a black one for. for oh, here we go. Oh, you've got one. Right, you didn't chew on this, did you? It's disgusting. All right. So. You said you didn't want it, so I said you chew So, what I would do with these, there's not much room when the, when the cylinder is completely assembled. So you gotta imagine it's all assembled, you got all the springs, the spring keepers, you got the rock rod coming like this, right? There's very little room, but these pen caps were great. You can get it back in there, and if they're white, you shine a little light because you, you kind of got it like this. And you get down and you shine a light here and look at that cap, you can see if there's any white, it means that it's not sitting 100% perfect. You're not gonna get a feeler gauge in there, uh, but you can see if it's not sitting perfect, and then I would align that one rocker arm, I would grind it just a little bit different so that it would hit that valve exactly and totally perfect. Which is why I say you should keep them in the right spot because if I ground this one just a little bit off to hit this valve and this one off just a little bit on that valve and you mixed them all up, then you could have one hitting quite crooked. But most people just throw them in anyway. So Anyway, I tell you that to tell you all that. So, so if you really cared, you would, you would check that and say, whoa, that's what, so if you have a customer who is constantly complaining about his valves going out, yeah, it's the third time I had this cylinder off. Like, yeah, I don't want to tell you, man, sorry. Check and check that alignment. And an interesting side note, I have run into other mechanics who have purposely ground rocker arms to hit this way. Job security. What's that? Job security. <laughs> no, it would make them rotate. He just pushes it off to the side to say, well, because we talked about the cam being ground just a little bit off to make these rotate. So if it works there, it must work here. So they'd grind them crooked and they'd be a lot crooked. It seemed like, whoa. And so they would say, think that the hitting it crooked it would cause it to rotate. Eh, it just, yeah, I suppose it rotated right after it wore out the guide. <laughs> Maybe you like that story. Maybe you didn't. Uh, hydraulic unit. All right, so I explained how the hydraulic unit worked. We don't use a magnet. Clearance was adjusted with a longer or shorter pitch rod. Adjusted. Valve clearance, we'll do that. Adjust it with longer 
or shorter push rod. There's like a million and one things to tell you. It's not like I've had a shortage of things to tell you. It's like, where do I even stop so I don't overload you? We've got all day tomorrow. We've got all day tomorrow. That's right. Uh, we talked about high flow, uh, high flow versus low flow. High flow versus low flow lifters. Uh, that's really a, a TCM thing. So TCM uses high and low flow, flow lifters. Um, usually, let me see. Well, usually it's high flow. High flow, which side? Do you remember? Uh, Very good. On exhaust side. Now, if it's if you have to think too, it's pumping them up. Then the ramp hits it on the cam, pushes it, and at that point it starts bleeding down. And it's it's that duration. That's a high flow is going to bleed down much faster. So what's that going to do to the duration of the valve? It's going to shorten the duration of the valve. But at the same time, it does what in a positive way? More oil. More oil. So you know these are the kind of things you think about. If it's an option, if you have a service bolt that gives you the option, you can put high flow lifters on the intake side. Hey, does that sound like a good idea? High flow, ooh, I like the sound of that. Is it a good thing? Not Why not? You're relying on other things to not let oil into your intake valve. Okay, but let's just say I've got nice new um, intake guides with nice new seals on them. I have nothing to worry about. What would be the downside to high flow lifter on the intake side? Short of valve duration, which means what? Less air. Less air, which means? Less volume. Less volume efficiency. efficiency. See, these are the things I, I think are, are, are much more important than identifying a semi tulip valve, but they didn't ask me, so. <laughs> All right, so high flow on exhaust side, but they did do high flow on the exhaust side because they want the higher flow of oil so that we get some better cooling. That's my take on it. Um, High flow on the exhaust side, so high flow, high flow, let me see. Um, high flow lifters <coughs> cause, this is kind of interesting, I'm not sure why they, they said this, but I want you to know it caused the duration of the valve to be less, but this source said at idle. Now it could be because the, the time is so short that it just doesn't, doesn't count, or it doesn't add up, let's see, that's at idle. So then according to that, on intake, it smooths out idle, so on intake, It smooths out the idle. So in other words, they're going to shorten the duration and it's going to get a little bit smoother idle. Um, on exhaust side, on exhaust side, it allows more oil to the guide or valve. If you have solid lifters, the bad part is, is you have to periodically adjust them. The other bad part is you're going to find out just how 
Well, it's not terribly difficult if you do it right. It's not easy to adjust these valves. You're, you're going to get a little frustrated. You may adjust one 20 times and you're like, it just doesn't work. So periodically adjusted. Um, one side, one side is preloaded. Preloaded, preloaded. One side is preloaded before adjustment. Okay, what that means is, so you're gonna have your engine all built up and you're gonna put everything together and say, all right, now we're ready to start adjusting our valves. And so you can rotate around, you bring number one, top dead center uh, of compression so that the, so neither one of the, uh, the rocker arms are touching and you're gonna set it so that it brings it up and it, and it touches the feeler gauge just right. Uh, and so if you do that, what you've done is you actually end up pushing the cam, you have a uh, float in your cam. There's a little bit of space in the cam journals to the cam. You want to take that out. So if you start by just adjusting number one, everything else is loose and it's going to push the cam one way. So what you do is on the opposite side, the two four, tighten the screws up, push the cam all the way over. Because that's where it's normally going to be. It's going to be have tension on both sides. So that's called preloading it. Then your instructions actually I think tell you that. So that's the preload. Tighten up the two four. And you're, it's not going to make any sense. Like, why are we tightening up the two four? I want to do the do the one, but you're going to do the one, you're doing that so it preloads it one way. So would you would you tighten both of them or the? I do. I just walk over to the other side and I just tighten them until I put a little tension on all four valves, uh -huh. and then walk over and then I start with number one, then I rotate it, then I do three, then I rotate it and do two, then rotate and then do four. Okay. One. One, nope, you gotta walk around one, then walk around two, spin it. Yeah, sorry, so. So you would do one, three, is what you would adjust one, three, and then do the same thing vice versa? Yeah, so I start here, do one, yeah. spin the motor, and follow it around. Now you're gonna be over here, do three, then you stand still, spin it, you're standing here looking at two, yeah. and then follow it around, you do four. So you only have to walk twice. That probably didn't need to tell you that. You'll figure that out. <laughs> You'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Every 100 hours. I believe that most service instructions say 100 hours. I would do it probably at 50 for my plane. What happens if you set it and you don't have sufficient clearance? Valve will stay open. That's a Q&A right there. Insufficient clearance. Uh, may cause the valve not to seat the valve we'll say be open when engine is cold so when it heats up then you'll have some clearance but up until that point not so much Uh, excessive clearance excessive valve clearance will cause valves to open late and close early All right, is your brain full? Yep. Well, mine's empty, so. <laughs> Fair enough.